Astro Psych 400, podcast for sleep. It's time to go to sleep now. Time to surround yourself with positive vibes. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about inner peace. Giving credit to wakeupcallandpathios.com for their source material. Question about inner peace. Do you have a tendency to think and act spontaneously rather than based on past experience? We live in a world now where we can share lots of information on the internet. We can also share a lot on social media. And I believe that many people are turning toward memes and stickers and small pieces of writing as a way to connect with philosophy, thoughtfulness, and inner peace. But perhaps it isn't the most effective way, because sometimes we can comprehend the meaning of, a, of an inspirational quote, but we can't completely put it into action. Some people say that this is just cherry-picking the parts that you want and then doing what you were going to do anyway, and other people say that the brain is drawn toward familiarity. We do what is familiar And in many ways, it can be difficult to change one's personality. And many people want to stand by the way that their personality is. They do not want to change. They do not want to compromise. They do not want to alter any type of aspect of themselves at all. Because the educational system in the United States of America, where I'm from, says very clearly, you have the right to be you. Be yourself, you are special, but once you enter into adulthood, you find that that type of behavior isn't accepted by everyone. Just because you're being yourself does not mean that you are contributing to society. So, do people act spontaneously, or do they, rather than based on a past experience? I think that people don't do either one of those. Instead, They inherit the behaviors from their parents, and they develop a personality that is a little bit based on their mother, a little bit based on their father, or if they grow up with a different guardian, then they have a personality based on the actions and behaviors of their parents, particularly between the ages of zero and four. And I think that this is very well documented in the cases of feral children. For example, if a child spends all of their time around monkeys, they will develop the mannerisms of monkeys. We saw this very clearly with the case of John Sabunia from Uganda, as well as the case of Oksana Malaya from the Ukraine, who spent lots of time with dogs as a kid, and she developed the mannerisms of a dog and was able to even bark and howl the same way that a dog could at almost pitch-perfect intervals. People recreate the experiences that they've had. But it's not only about learning experience. I think that this um, question, it makes you think that it's more about the learning and the life lessons and the education and comprehending information. If you want to say experience, it has to be about behaviors and thought patterns and life choices. That type of experience is definitely the way people act. The first part of this question is, do you have a tendency to think and act spontaneously? Now, I once used the term spontaneous to describe jazz music, and the person that I was talking to said, spontaneity stems from a fake identity which doesn't exist. Something cannot be spontaneous and have an identity. And I responded by saying that, but... Jazz music is improvised, it isn't planned out, and the response that I got was, that is not spontaneous, it's just repetitive. And I began to think for a second, yes, jazz music is improvised, but it is played on a mode or a scale of different notes, and then certain notes are repeated. So yes, indeed, it is repetitive. And I was forced to agree, spontaneity stems from a fake identity which doesn't exist meaning that a person cannot do something spontaneous. There is going to be a repetition in their behaviors and the way that they are acting, and this is going to lead them to choose different pathways in the future. 
That is not spontaneity. Spontaneity might exist with things like atomic structures and particles and things that do not have an identity. And a very clear case of this is spontaneous human combustion. When certain elemental factors in a person create a spontaneous combustion reaction and someone can actually catch on fire based on just the chemicals in their biological makeup. So it is absolutely horrible, but that's not an identity. That is just a different reaction that occurred between two scientific possibilities colliding. The second question is, do you have an unmistaken ability to enjoy each and every minute? No, absolutely not. And most people don't enjoy each and every minute. I'm very envious of the people who only emit positive vibes, and I'm even more envious of the people who never get affected by outside forces like external stimuli when someone is shouting at them and they don't feel anything. That is something that many people are envious of because it is a fascinating personality trait all the same. There are people in the world who perhaps can enjoy each and every minute but it's not always a good thing. Just because someone is enjoying life, it doesn't mean that they are contributing to the collective well-being and to the collective consciousness of those around them. If something is fun for you, but not fun for anyone else, that doesn't mean that you should do it. The same way, if someone is enjoying themselves, but no one else around them is enjoying their presence, Perhaps they should alter their behavior, and this is very, very connected to the first question, because people do not want to change. And I think a big problem that many people have in their adulthood is they want the world to conform to their personality. They want their personality traits to be the guiding force for morality, ethics, virtue, and perhaps in some cases legislation. And the reason why is they have a belief system. They believe that these are good things and that people should behave this way. But the problem is a single human does not get to dictate morality, ethics, and virtue for the entirety of the planet Earth. Sometimes in life we will experience an agreed-upon ideal that has been established over these centuries, history, culture, and human development, have pushed us toward certain um, factors in life which we can all agree are unacceptable. And some people believe that that is only the learning process that history, culture, and human development allow us to understand the ideal which was not created by any particular human. It is simply an aspect of conscious awareness and it is simply an aspect of existence itself that we should not be committing acts of unwarranted destruction. Unwarranted destruction needs to also be removed from the mind as well as from the external world. Some people talk about the word cruelty, saying that cruelty is unacceptable, inappropriate, it should not be used in any type of society. If you were to have a society that was governed by cruelty, it would be a horribly ineffective society, and it doesn't contribute to the collective well-being. At that point, though, one needs to differentiate between well-being and happiness. There was a book out by Dr. Michael Shermer called The Science of Good and Evil, where he proposed that the human concept of good and evil is collective happiness. Goodness is moving toward the collective happiness of a social group, and evil is moving toward away from collective happiness and toward collective misery. The problem with Dr. Michael Shermer's thinking is Happiness is very superficial, and it doesn't get to the heart of the issue. And just because a group is experiencing happiness, it doesn't mean that they are committing an immoral action. For example, someone can be very happy by hurting someone. I mean, that's the what sadism is all about. People enjoy inflicting pain upon other people. And a response that is often brought up is, oh, well, if someone enjoys hurting other people, then that person isn't truly happy. Well, what is true happiness? Well, it's happiness that is partnered with morality. Oh, well, then what do you want people to experience? Do you want it to be happiness or do you want it to be morality? And I definitely believe that it is the latter, that morality, ethics, 
virtue are the actual goal that people are supposed to experience, and happiness is just a way of navigating. For, for example, a society can do an immoral action and still have collective happiness. Public execution, for example, if they feel better that someone has been executed, whether or not that person deserved to die, I mean, that that is not even relevant in the minds of the townspeople because they want to have this person executed. What if it turns out that this person is innocent and they aren't aware of it? Is that a moral action? Is that done in the name of goodness? I would say absolutely not. So sometimes the term well-being is used instead, and people do things to further the collective well-being. But there's also a word, cooperation. The collective cooperation of humanity is what can push society forward, as opposed to something such as just simply happiness. Question 3. Have you lost interest in judging others? No, I have not personally, and it's very difficult to avoid judgment, but to achieve a sense of inner peace. I'm reminded of something that I learned from Jesse Peterson when he said, Any time you get lost in your imagination, that's bad. You need to be in the presence of God, and you need to be in the present moment. Whether you believe in God is beside the point now, because you can approach this in a secular manner. Most notably, he is saying that when you get lost in your imagination, and you're thinking about people from your daily life, you're either telling yourself that you're better than someone, or you're putting yourself down. And in, the, in a very broad context, I tend to see that that is true. However, sometimes this is a powerful force to try and resist. And what Peterson encourages us to do is, do not let that force have any reaction at all. Don't run from it. Don't try to hide from it. Don't engage with it. When you start thinking about bad experiences that you've had, people in your personal life, someone who was mean to you five years ago, and bad conversations... Tell yourself, I have no opinion about that. And I was discussing this on the YouTube channel, Black Box Online Radio, and somebody said when they experience bad memories and uh, perhaps post-traumatic stress as well would fit into this category, what they tell themselves is, rewind, 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 if that works for them. For me, on a personal level, I was using the term, I have no opinion about that. And you can practice this for 15 minutes a day, sit upright in a chair, close your eyes with no sound on, whatever you can hear, maybe the train going by your house, or the people walking outside, or if you hear the birds, or any sound at all. You focus on the present, and if you find yourself getting lost in your imagination, say, I have no opinion about that. And the final point about this subject is is in relation to doubt everything that you are thinking, both the good and the bad, because you're either building yourself up or you're letting yourself down. You're telling yourself, I am great, I am the king or the queen, and then you're telling yourself that you are nothing. And you can see this very clearly with people who go on to be featured in true crime documentaries. They experience something where they feel both worthless and godlike. They're experiencing the emotional roller coaster of life, as opposed to achieving a sense of inner peace. Have you lost interest in judging yourself? Absolutely, I've lost interest in it, but it is, once again, easier, easier said than done. Number five, have you lost interest in conflict? 100% wholeheartedly, I have lost interest in conflict, because I don't believe that we're supposed to experience conflict. Some people think that, Conflict is part of life, and I remember something from Jordan Peterson, the psychologist, when he said, if you're not fighting, you're not in a relationship, but the program Free Domain Radio provided an alternative saying, I do not argue with my wife, I never fight with my wife, because I love her, and that one was also talking about how if someone is yelling at you, they don't care about you, 
because they will not do that when there are consequences that are important to them. They will not behave that way if it will make them look bad, or if they will receive some type of punishment, which means that they do have the ability to control themselves. They're just actively choosing not to. They're actively letting these very negative emotions come out, such as anger, misery, as well as emotions that are connected to other abstract principles such as hatred, such as furiosity, and letting these very, very destructive feelings and emotions be projected onto somebody else. Conflict is bad. Conflict is only supposed to be the means to an end. There is destruction, there is unwarranted destruction, and there is warranted destruction. Warranted destruction means that there is a type of justification for it. If someone is trying to punch you in the face and you block them with your forearm and they stumble and fall and hit their head, that would be an act of warranted destruction because it was done in defense. Unwarranted destruction would be if you were to try and punch someone in the face who hasn't done anything wrong to you and you were to hit them, break their nose or maybe break their jaw, and that person had no reason to be punched in the face, that is an example of unwarranted destruction. And that's bad, that's evil, that's cruel, that's immoral, it's whatever negative adjective you would like to attribute to that. But that is an unnecessary conflict, and in both scenarios an unnecessary origin of the conflict exists, which means that we need to remove that origin. We need to remove conflict. Conflict should not exist in a pure world. And in the concept of inner peace, conflict should not exist within the mind. Someone should not be battling with emotions such as anger and sadness, or perhaps something such as fear. They should not be present if you actually want to achieve the ideal state. So, Firstly, being aware of one's own conscious experience of existence and recognizing that there is an ideal that we're meant to strive toward and it's going to be difficult to remove destruction from one's life, to remove conflict from one's life, to remove evil, misery, cruelty, sadness, anger, and fear from one's life. And a lot of people do not want to give these up because they recognize a survival mechanism that has been implemented with these emotions over the centuries. Perhaps you've heard something about how anger is an evolutionary response to injustice, sadness is a response to grief, and fear is heavily connected to survival. People are afraid of things because it can hurt them, but if you actually live in a world where you do not need to be afraid, you no longer need the fear. If you live in a world where you no longer are attached to anything, then you don't need sadness. And if you live in a world where injustice doesn't exist, you don't need anger. Back in 2014, I was reading a lot about the religion of Jainism, and one point I com didn't quite comprehend was when it talked about relinquishing connections to other people, and I was thinking, how could a father or a mother relinquish connection to their child? How could any parent do that? Perhaps even other family members, if you're very close to them. And I believe that this is meant to take place later in life, when someone is supposed to recognize that the children are grown up and they are on their own, and now it is their responsibility to achieve a sense of inner peace, because the connections to humanity will always create these types of emotions. As we said, there are reasons why emotions happen, whether it's anger, sadness, or fear, but it can be, it can be lived in a way in which these emotions are not present. Question 6. Have you lost interest in interpreting the actions and motives of others? Not completely, because it's very addictive. It's very addictive to analyze other people and to try and understand how people are thinking. Self-help, psychology, watching Dr. Phil on the television, all of these will lead you to try and analyze other people. Dr. Phil said this himself, the reason why he became a psychologist was because he not only wanted to know what other people were thinking, but he wanted to know why they were thinking and what was the exact thought that was in their mind when they were committing the actions. It's not just the reason why they did it, 
what was the exact thing going through their brain when they chose to commit those actions. It is very, very addictive for people to try and think in this process. But the problem is, though, it's just that. It's going back to judgment. It's going back to reliving bad experiences. It's going back to ruminating on post-traumatic stress. And when you try and interpret the actions of others, you might not always get it right. You might think that you understand the other people and the reasons why they do things, but you're only looking at it based on a very narrow section of their experiences. Some people really try to connect this to the mother and father. Sigmund Freud was all about this, that your parents are the biggest influences on your life and the way that your parents acted towards you when you were a kid models your behavior, your sexuality, your actions, your mood, your temperament. All of that comes from the parents. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are somewhat 50-50 about Freud in the current world. But have we lost interest in interpreting the actions and motives of others? I don't think that we ever will. And unless I can actually achieve this pure euphoric, not even euphoric, but beyond euphoric, a pure state of purity, really, then I don't believe I ever will get away from that. And I don't think many people will get away from that. But I misspoke when I said the word euphoria, because that's going back to the concept of happiness or because there is this type of pleasure release that that's why you should do it well that's just chasing your own neurotransmitters that isn't morality that isn't ethics i mean people who are high on ecstasy might feel very euphoric it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what inner peace is all about and the next one number seven have you lost the ability to worry no, I haven't, because when you live in a world outside of self-help books and podcasts and YouTube, you have to deal with things. And some people say, hey, don't worry about it. There's nothing you can do. But sometimes there are things that you can do, and you have to respond to things. And I knew someone once who wouldn't say, don't worry about it. What he would say was, just let it go. Just let it go. But then he was telling a story once about his first wife and said, oh, well, okay, I was getting divorced from my first wife and I couldn't let it go. I had to do something about it. And that is the whole point. He had to make certain decisions based on his actions. And like He had to respond to the conflict. There is a problem and he can't simply walk away from it. He had to go through the proceedings of the divorce and he had to sort out the conflict and achieve a peaceful resolution. I mean, that would be the ideal sense. And the bigger ideal, the perhaps the more grand ideal, would be to never have any conflict to begin with. But he wasn't in that ideal state yet. He had to respond to it. So, in those situations, we do indeed worry about things. Number eight. Do you have a frequent overwhelming episode of appreciation? Of course, absolutely. I can get addicted to self-praise, I can get addicted to self-congratulation, and this is a little bit personal, but I frequently tell myself, I am wonderful, and this is exactly what that silent prayer was talking about, with doubt everything that you are thinking, you're going to tell yourself, I'm a king, I'm a queen, I'm a wonderful person, and then later on throughout the day, you're going to be telling yourself, I'm a screw-up, I'm a mess. This is heavily exemplified on the television show Seinfeld, if you've ever seen George Costanza, in what Jason Alexander openly said, an overinflated ego with a very fragile centerpiece, and it can be broken very easily, and then someone can just say, I'm a mess. At one point you think that you are in some type of overinflated self-congratulatory world, and the next second you're saying, I am not well at all. There is also a meme that was put out recently talking about how we learn about philosophy, but it was from the football coach, John Madden, who only recently passed away, and it said, self-praise is for losers, meaning that simply telling yourself that you are wonderful, or that you're better than someone, or that you are good in any way is not enough. It is insufficient. From time to time, I think we will all get caught up in a little bit of self-praise, but 
it is not the only thing we should try and achieve because it's not coming from an outside source. There's no one there to validate or certify the praise that you are giving yourself. And furthermore, it just leads to a very addictive type of thinking where if someone is getting self-praise for doing absolutely nothing, then they're not going to want to interact with other people. Instead, they're just going to want to sit around and wallow in their own self-praise and self-congratulation. I am great. I am wonderful. Everyone else is wrong because they do not understand me. But th that will lead to a very large sense of ignorance with the other aspects of life. Number nine, do you have contented feelings of connectedness with others in nature? Absolutely, we are all connected, and every footprint leaves an impact on the world in some way, and we all share the same conscious experience of existence, and if you don't want to bring pain to yourself, do not bring pain to your world, because you are on the earth, you are a part of the earth, you are a part of the cosmos, and you are connected to the cosmos. If you do not want to bring about misery to your own life, why would you bring it to somebody else's? You share the same experience. Their experience is your experience, because we are all conscious at the same time, and the people who have passed away are existing in our memories, and they will influence our behavior, and then we will influence the future generations. Absolutely, we are connected with nature. Number 10. Do you have frequent attacks of smiling through the heart? Absolutely, but this goes back to addiction, and some people think it's very strange when someone is smiling or laughing without an external factor. And back when I began to observe people a little more closely, I noticed that there were two types of children who misbehave. One type was the child who is misbehaving because of outside external factors, and they're talking to their friends, or they are roughhousing, they're getting out of their seat and running around. And then there is the child who is internal, who's misbehaving because of internal factors, and that is like ideas. They are misbehaving because they're thinking about something. They have mental distractions, and this is a real concept called psychological noise, where it's the same as if there were a loud piece of music playing, or a car was going by the house in a really loud way. That is physical noise, but when someone is thinking about something that distracts them, that is psychological noise, and children who are misbehaving because of internal factors are heavily influenced by psychological noise. They start thinking about the subject that they shouldn't, they're looking out the window, getting distracted, perhaps they are trying to draw and doodle when they should be paying attention. These are very frustrating for other people, and I noticed that many people were visibly upset with the students who were not focused on the lesson, but they're distracted because of internal factors. And I believe the reason why is because people don't comprehend it. They don't know how to alleviate the situation. If it's an external problem, someone is talking to their friends or roughhousing or getting out of their seat, well, then you tell them, please don't talk to your friends in class. You tell them to sit down and be polite and sit quietly. But the kid distracted by psychological noise is already sitting down and is is being polite and is being very quiet. They're just thinking about something else. And this can even relate to smiling, where if someone is laughing or smiling and people can't tell why, then it confuses them. And always remember that mankind fears what it does not understand. And for the longest time, I wanted to be someone who was defending the concept of individuality, saying, I think about funny things and I laugh. I'm definitely someone who laughs and smiles at things when no one else is around, and I was just that. I think about funny things and I laugh. But what did I say before? If something is fun for you and not fun for anyone else, then you shouldn't do it. And that goes in that category. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to keep up with, but it simply doesn't contribute to the collective well-being. Do you have increased susceptibility to love that's extended by others, as well as the uncontrollable urge to extend it? I don't know about an uncontrollable urge. I have almost an uncontrollable urge to extend euphoria, but about love? 
I think that, um, well, I shouldn't even say uncontrollable, because this goes back to consequences. Remember what we were saying about consequences for actions. If someone is yelling at you, they don't care about you because they will not behave that way. If there are consequences for their actions, well, it's just like that. It's exactly like that. If people are going to get in trouble in some way, if they're going to be punished for exhibiting these types of urges, many people will not do them, so there are very few uncontrollable urges, and most importantly with consequences, consequences that they care about. For example, if someone is acting on uncontrollable urges and gets sent to jail, but they don't care about going to jail, then there's no harm done to them, no problem at all. Do you have an increasing tendency to let things happen rather than to manipulate them and make them happen? Not exactly, because there's some things that you cannot control, the sunrise and the sunset, and there was this poem once that ended with, Let evening come, and somebody in the poetry workshop said, Wait a second, how can you let evening come? You cannot control the uh, morning and the evening and the night. And someone else replied, Well, it's about acceptance. It's about accepting that you are part of the um, spheres of existence. But would you, do you have an increasing tendency to let things happen rather than to manipulate them? I think with a lot of them, we try to manipulate, but we're just not always successful. People have an enormous desire for manipulation, and sometimes when people can't manipulate, they run away. And other people, when they can't manipulate, they just allow someone else to manipulate them, and none of those will ever be present during inner peace. Inner peace will only happen once there is an appreciation of existence, consciousness, and bliss. Bliss as defined as faultlessness and removing unwarranted destruction from one's life. So warranted destruction could be removed from someone's life. Then all forms of destruction will not exist and they will only be surrounded by their own awareness of love. Thank you for listening to Astro Psych 400. Good night.